Hello, my name is Maxine Moffitt and you are tuned in to Bridge Africa this week, the program that connects you to Africa's top headline stories, from economics to politics and sports to culture. We'll begin with the top news story. A report published by the World Health Organization revealed that malaria could be eradicated in six African countries by the year 2020. One of Africa's musical icons, Congolese-born Papa Wimba, died during a concert in the Ivorian capital of Abidjan. The South African sports minister banned four of the country's sports federations from bidding for major international tournaments. Thank you so much for tuning in to Bridge Africa this week. We will start the show right after the break. A World Health Organization report revealed that malaria could be wiped out from six African countries by the year 2020. The report was published to mark the World Malaria Day. Amongst the countries listed by the World Health Organization is South Africa. The country has witnessed a drastic decrease in the number of malaria cases from 64,000 in 2000 to 11,700 in 2014. These statistics convinced the health organization to suggest that through targeted action and cross-border collaboration, the country has the potential to eliminate malaria by 2020. Other countries where the disease could be eradicated by 2020 include Algeria, Botswana, Cape Verde, Comoros, and Swaziland. The World Health Organization revealed that the only African state which did not record a case of malaria in 2014 was Morocco. The report says since the year 2000, malaria mortality rates in Africa have declined by 66% among all age groups and by 71% among children under 5 years old. Influential Congolese musical artist Papa Wimba died after collapsing in a concert in Cote d'Ivoire. Reports said that he was 66 years old. His fans all over the world are still paying him homage. A video from the show in Abidjan in Ivory Coast showed him slumped on stage behind a group of dancers before the rush to his aid. A few seconds later, he was said to be ill in the early hours of Saturday morning. The cause of his death had not been established as he died before he was taken to the hospital. His pioneering blend of African, Cuban and Western sounds became one of Africa's most popular music styles. Born in 1949, Wemba, whose name was Shongu Wembadio Pene Kikumba, began his singing career in religious choirs. He helped modernize Congolese rumba music with the genre that surfaced, sukus, and influenced music across Africa. Being a fashion icon, Papa Wemba owned music bands and acted in two movies. Congolese President Joseph Kabila expressed his condolences and Culture Minister Baduin Banza Mukali said his death was a great loss for the country and all of Africa. Several events paying homage to the departed music star are organized by his friends and fans. <laughs> And to talk further about the untimely and unfortunate death of the music legend Papa Wimma, we have in our studio today Chimbi Muna, who is a musical and cultural expert of sorts. So Chimbi, first I want you to talk about some of the reactions to the recent death of Papa Wimma. Yes, the main reaction was a reaction of shock across yeah. the whole African community. Mm. Remember Papa Wimba died at age 66, and the manner in which he died, performing live on stage, gave us a big shock. Yeah, that is a shock. You know, but I was looking at a recent um, article um, that was written about him where he has often said that he wishes to actually die on stage. Yeah. Papa Wemba, uh, that's why they call him the king of rumba. Uh, he was a real professional. 
all he did was music. Wow. And many times when they interviewed him, he even said that was the only thing he knew how to do. And that as long as he will be living, he will always do music. Whenever he will be called to perform, he will always perform. And he even extended to say he would like to die on stage performing. Wow. So it seems like he sort of prophesied his own, his own death, which I'm sure he wasn't ready for the day, but he died in the way that he wanted to die, which very we, few of us get a chance to We could say that, or, or like the Americans say, professional to the bone. Yes. <laughs> professional to the bone, Papa Wimba. So what do you think it was that made him such a world icon, not just Congolese icon, not just African icon, but a world icon? Yes, Papa Wimba at age 20 started a group called Zaiko Langa Langa. You know, that made big names like uh, Kofi Olomide, Keste Menea, and, and uh, Awilo Longomba. And also, in 1977, he started a band also that did a lot of collaborations with other great names. So I think it's 45 years of music that gave him uh, this wow. big legacy. Wow. And when did Roomba, Roomba music start exactly? Is, is it popular in other African countries? Is it particular to Congo? Originally, it started in Congo, maybe mm -hmm. with guys like Tabule. I won't, okay. I won't pinpoint the exact date. But it started in Congo with people like uh, Tabule and the rest. But Papa Wemba was the one that exported rumba music the most. All over the world. All over the world. Yeah, and I know there was a certain point in time when um, uh, uh, world music really became really popular and people started just kind of calling all the different genres of music around the world as world music if it wasn't jazz or if it wasn't pop music and I know Papa Wimba did a lot to bring world music to the stage. Yeah. A lot of people in the press even said Papa Wemba was at the origin of the name world music. Mm. But as I say this is forty five years of, of, of performance, of a rich career and a lot of collaborations with people like Manu Dibango, Angelique Kijo, King Sonny Ade, people that did different genres. So when Papa Wemba does a collaboration with King Sonny Ade that does high life or collaboration with Manu Dibango that does Makosa Mm. And you have a fusion of rumba and makosa. Mm. So I think the producers find, found it uh, just convenient to create a different genre that englobes all those different blends of African music. Mm. And it was baptized world music. And what special actions have been taken? I know he died in Cote d'Ivoire and, 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 and even by his government. What special actions do you think have happened that have been very particular to his death? I'll, I'll talk about immediate actions because remember he just died a few days ago. Yes, exactly. But his body was just returned to Exactly. He died during Congo. the festival. So, you know, they had to let the festival go till the end. But what was particular in his case, the government of Congo moved. His wife left, the Minister of Culture left, and they went to Ivory Coast to get the cop. So I think, you know, it's, it's already been a national uh, uh, program to, yes. to transfer the cops, you know, and, and things like that. So I think it's still early to judge what are the actions. But again, as I said, everybody's mobilized. Not only the Congolese artists, the African artists are mobilized around this to give him a befitting burial. Yeah, I think this is so good. And like you said, he died doing what he loved to the bone, you know, and it's so good for you to come to talk to us today about Papa Wimba and his legacy. I really appreciate it, Chimbi. It's a pleasure and he'll be missed. He'll be greatly missed, Papa Wimba. Okay, next time. Thank you. Landlock Uganda has announced that it will build a major pipeline to export its oil to Tanzania. Uganda has planned to send the pipeline through Kenya, which wanted a joint facility for oil for its own fields that are under development. Uganda announced its decision in Kampala at a summit of East African Community Bloc, which groups Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda and South Sudan. The 1,400-kilometer pipeline would connect Uganda's western region near Hoima, where big oil reserves have been discovered with Tanzania's port of Tanga. The pipeline will now extend further south of the country, with concerns about possible attacks by the Somali Al-Shabaab Islamist group. The group has attacked targets close to where the pipeline would have passed. The project is expected to cost about $4 billion and create 15,000 jobs. The discovered oil reserves in Uganda are estimated at about 6.5 billion barrels and the country expects to start production in 2018. Kenya, which has also struck oil, had wanted the pipeline to pass through its territory. Uganda had initially signed such a deal, but later backed down due to security concerns. Reports also suggest 
that Uganda backed the Tanzanian road because the country's port of Tanga is already fully operational, while Kenya's Lamido port is still being built. When completed, it would be East Africa's major oil pipeline. Heavy floods in some drought-stricken parts of Ethiopia killed several people and livestock. This happened at a time when rain was awaited ahead of the planting season. This incident blocked food and aid deliveries in the country. Spring rains was expected in Ethiopia to replenish water sources and to plant crops after the most severe drought in decades that pushed about 10 million people into hunger. Due to the heavy downpour, many livestock weakened by the drought died in Ethiopia's remote Somali and Afar regions, according to Mohamed Hassan, head of the Norwegian Refugee Council. He said roads were turning into raging rivers and trucks carrying food assistance were unable to reach many communities. This, he said, could lead to human loss. The Ethiopian government's said about 28 people were killed by flash floods in early April. When a river passing through Jijiga burst its banks, the government and aid agencies are revising a joint appeal in December for $1.4 billion as the number of districts suffering a humanitarian emergency has widened. The crisis is expected to deepen until August when people hope to harvest crops to be planted in June this year. The World Health Organization urged travelers to Angola to get yellow fever vaccinations. An outbreak of the disease in the African country has killed at least 258 people and there are 1,975 suspected cases that have been recorded in the country. The World Health Organization's Director General, Margaret Chan, said large urban areas are at particular risk and strongly urged all travelers to Angola to ensure they are vaccinated against yellow fever. The outbreak began in December in Angola's capital, Luanda, and has since spread to most of the country's provinces with more than 1,975 suspected cases. She said cases of yellow fever linked to this outbreak had been detected in other countries of Africa and Asia. The World Health Organization African office noted that yellow fever from Angola had been reported in China, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Kenya. Other cases were reported in Uganda, but World Health Organization officials said travelers had no history of traveling to Angola. The disease is transmitted by the same mosquito that spread Zika and dengue viruses, but death rates are higher and 75% of the cases require admission to the hospital. Yellow fever expert Jack Woodall, who formerly worked for the World Health Organization and the U.S. Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, said he was worried that the outbreak could spread rapidly along a major trunking road from DR Congo to Uganda's capital, Kampala. He called for intensified surveillance of this trade road and said vaccination of people living along it should be top priority. The World Health Organization launched a vaccination campaign in February targeting 7 million people to try to prevent further spread of the disease. A six-meter high statue of the late South African President Nelson Mandela has been unveiled in the Palestinian city of Ramallah. The statue is a gift from the city of Johannesburg to the West Bank city, which is home to the Palestinian administration. The city of Johannesburg presented a six-meter high bronze statue of the late South African president, Nelson Mandela, smiling with his fist up in the air to the Palestinian city of Ramallah. The statue was said to weigh two tons. It is a gift from the city of Johannesburg to the West Bank city, which remains home to the Palestinian administration. Palestinian President Mahamwat Abbas and several other dignitaries were present for the unveiling of the statue in the upscale area of al Tira. As Jean France Press reported, authorities say the statue symbolizes the shared sufferings of South Africans and Palestinians. Ramallah and Johannesburg are considered as twin cities. Mr. Mosa Hadid, Ramallah's mayor, said with Mandela's statue, Ramallah intends to send a clear message to the colonizer and occupier, Israel, 
as he is quoted saying, we are much closer to freedom than you think. The South African ruling party, the African National Congress, said that it would take legal action against the opposition leader, Julius Malema, for destabilizing public peace. Mr. Malema, who was sacked as leader of the ANC Youth League in 2012, previously criticized the policies of President Zuma. Still to come on Bridge Africa this week, a Cameroonian footballer has been shortlisted for BBC's Best in Football Award. A new report by the Washington-based Freedom House revealed that freedom of the press declined in Africa and around the world in 2015 and that it's at its lowest point than it's ever been in more than a decade. Countries facing political instability are amongst the worst ranking. According to the report, the worst clampdown on journalists in Africa took place in Burundi, a Great Lakes nation where effort by President Pierre Nkurunziza to extend his mandate beyond constitutional limit have pushed the country to the brink of a civil war. Freedom House says journalists have been imprisoned, beaten and killed, and nearly all independent media outlets have been shut down. Burundi aside, another country named by Freedom House for media repression is Eritrea. In its 2016 report, the organization ranked Eritrea and Equatorial Guinea, fifth and eighth, respectively, all from the bottom. The organization's director in charge of research for freedom of the press, Jennifer Dunham, lamented that Eritrea remains on the worst ranking position because all private news outlets have been outlawed. The country has recently allowed foreign correspondents to enter the country. However, June Ham said local media is strictly controlled and journalists remain in prison. Despite this bleak picture painted by Freedom House, there is some light in the continent's horizon. The East African Court of Justice, a judicial body established by the East African community, ruled against a repressive media law in Burundi. Similarly, the Economic Committee of West African State Court of Justice is hearing argument in a case brought by the Federation of African Journalists against Gambia and its liberal laws designed to muffle the press. The Freedom House 2016 report evaluated the decree of media freedom in 199 countries and territories across the world. Kenyan police fire tear gas on opposition leaders and supporters marching in the capital of Nairobi. The opposition is demanding that the commission be dissolved before the next general election in 2017. The commission is accused of favoring the ruling party in previous elections. Riot police surrounded the offices of Kenya's electoral commission in central Nairobi, blocking opposition leaders and supporters from approaching the building. When the opposition groups and their members tried pressing forward, police moved in and tear gas the crowd. Running battles ensued along a bossy highway in the capital for half an hour. Among those tear gas was former Prime Minister Raila Odinga. The opposition accuses the commission of favoring the ruling Jubilee Alliance in the last election and on county signatures calling for a referendum on proposed land and electoral reforms. The opposition has been called upon to dialogue with the government but its members insist on marching until their demands are met. The National Council of Churches of Kenya and the country's top labor federation have also called for the commission to be disbanded. The clerics said the commission has lost credibility and cannot organize a fair and free election. The International Criminal Court said that it is opening a preliminary probe into the violence that erupted in Burundi last year. The ICC prosecutor Fatou Bensouda said that the probe is not an investigation and stated that no timeline on the duration of the probe has been stated. In a statement announcing her decision on Monday, she said she had been closely tracking the eruption of violence in the Central African nation that had been a member of the Hague-based court since 2004. Burundi's political crisis was triggered last year when President Pierre Nkurunziza ran for a disputed third term. Ben Suda said at least 430 people have been killed, 3,400 have been arrested, and more than 230 Burundians have fled the country. Human Rights Watch International welcomed the International Criminal Court's announcement, but said it was only a first step. The United Nations has accused Burundi's security services 
of torturing and illegally detaining hundreds of people this year. Last month, the European Union suspended aid to the Burundian government over the political crisis. On Monday, a high-ranking general and his wife were reportedly killed while dropping their daughter off at school. U.S. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon condemned the attack against the general who had served with the UN peacekeeping mission in the Central African Republic. The president has ruled for more than 37 years, and our correspondent, Valerie Kilo and Salar, has followed up the situation and joins me in the studio to talk more about this current win. So, Valerie, how common is it for a president to win by more than 99%, not 99%, but more than 99%? Yeah, you're right. In fact, the exact figures, 99.6%. Wow. Um, that, that's common in Equatorial Guinea uh, since Teodoro Biengema took over power in 1979 in a military coup in which he overthrew uh, um, uh, Francisco uh, Ngema. So uh, since then, he's always won at least uh, above 97%. So these results are quite common in Equatorial Guinea. And it's, it does not just operate uh, for presidential election, even for municipal elections in the country uh, and legislative elections. The uh, ruling party, that's the Democratic Party of Teodoro Biangue members, who go, always wins uh, about uh, 80, 90 percent. So these are really common uh, results in, in, in the country when you look at the uh, past elections that have been held so far. And what do you think have been the actions of the incumbent and current president that have allowed him to have such high approval ratings? Well, it's, well, he has done a lot for Equatorial Guinea, but it's not just the actions of the president that's contributed to these huge numbers of votes. It's also because of the state of the opposition in Equatorial Guinea. Um, uh, as we speak, there are a number of political parties in Equatorial Guinea, but most of these part political parties are fractured, they are disorganized, and they are not united enough to form a strong force to actually um, uh, fight and overthrow Teodoro Biangema and Bazogo. Just to give you a clearer idea, there are about three um, uh, parties there of the opposition Okay. or categorized into three sections, if you like. There's a section that basically supports the incumbent uh, President Teodoro Biangema, or what they describe as a presidential majority, where we have the opposition members also part of, of the ruling party. Uh, okay. th th there's also some uh, one or two parties that is actually legalized. And apart from that, there's a third category in which uh, they actually operate clandestinely uh, and illegally. So uh, within that kind of chaotic environment in the opposition, it's unlikely that they can actually uh, beat the incumbent President Teodoro or Biangema and Bazogo. And uh, talking about his actions, as you raised in, in your question, he's done a lot for the country. The, the infrastructural development has increased on the continent. Uh, in, the, in, in the country, if you like. So we look at the roads, you look at uh, the seaport, you look at the airport. You see there's been a lot. Infrastructural development specifically in the sports sector. You remember Equatorial Guinea hosted the Africa Cup of Nations in yes, 2015? I do. Yes. And uh, before that they even co-hosted it in 2012 with uh, Gabon. So this tells you of the magnitude of the infrastructural development in that country under the auspices of Teodoro Obiange mm. Mambazogo. Wow, yeah, 99% approval rating um, that is backed up by uh, being elected uh, and being in power for more than 37 years is very powerful and speaks for itself. Thank you so much, Valerie, for coming to talk to us about this today and um, the run of uh, presidential elections that have happened so far in 2016, as we've had a lot. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Cameroon striker Gael Nganamut has been shortlisted for the 2016 BBC Women's Footballer of the Year Award. Other nominees are from France, Scotland and the USA. The Cameroon forward grabbed the title of Best Player of AFCON 2014 during the second playing day against Algeria. Between 2012 and 2013, she played for a Serbian side, Spartak Sobotica where she scored the most rapid goal in feminine football. Her football career began in a local club, Lorema, in Yaoundé in 2009. Her football prowess has made the head coach of the team, Endongacho, to describe her as an exceptional player. 
This exceptional talent will however be challenged by other nominees for the 2016 BBC Award. These include France midfielder Amandine Henry, Scotland midfielder Kim Little, and US pair Kelly Liot and Becky Swabrun. The shortlist was selected by a panel of experts including administrators, journalists, coaches and former players. South Africa's sports minister banned four of the country's major sports federations from bidding for major international tournaments after they failed to create enough opportunities for black players. Rugby, cricket, athletics and netball are the affected federations. The South African Rugby Union had announced it would bid for the 2023 Rugby World Cup by the June deadline. But Minister Fikele Balula says the ban is in place for at least a year. The South African government has long encouraged the country's men's sport to create more opportunities for black players. The country's five major sports federations agreed on various transformation targets with the government in 2014, but football was the only one to meet its target. The ban comes into effect immediately and Mr. Balula said the decision will be reviewed after he has received the results of the Federation's transformation efforts from 2016 to 2017, which could be as late as 2018. Both the Ruby and Cricket Federations said their officials will go into closed doors meetings with sports ministry officials after the announcement. Athletics South Africa said it will need to study the pronouncement made by the minister before commenting. The ban will not affect the 2022 Commonwealth Games, which has already been awarded to Duban as the bid was led by the South African Olympic Committee. Thank you so much for tuning in to Bridge Africa this week. My name is Maxine Moffat, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Bridge Africa 24 and get your top headline stories on our website, bridgeafrica24.com. Peace and blessings.